Well, good morning, everybody. It's been a privilege to work with Dr. Nedley and to be able to find out all the little details of what happened during that program. See, when I started working for this program, I knew this was good. I mean, the patients were getting well, and the results, you could see that this was working very well. But I did not realize how good it was. We found out that we have a response rate of 95%. 95% of the people that participate of the program get better. So before I start digging into some of the latest studies that we have been published in the scientific literature, I just wanted to give you a, a little brief introduction of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm co-author with uh, Dr. Hans Deal, Neil Barnard, Michael Greger, Caldwell Essentiel in the book uh, Rethink Food. Originally, I studied computer science. In fact, I never thought I was going to get involved with lifestyle medicine. I finished my computer science degree, and in one weekend, I visited a friend of mine that was taking a, a massage class in a lifestyle center in Southern California. I was just visiting that weekend, and that place had a lot of computer problems. So in one weekend, I was able to fix most of them. The doctor in charge there, Dr. Charles Thomas, was very impressed about it. So he offered me to hire me if I wanted to join his staff. I had already been accepted to study a master's degree in computer science, so it was a difficult decision. But it was a decision that changed my life forever. As I joined the staff of Dr. Thomas, I started seeing what was happening with lifestyle medicine. Diabetes was being reversed. High blood pressure was being reversed. Depression, autoimmune diseases, and all kinds of problems were being fixed. So after seeing that, I said, this is what I need to do with my life. I need to do lifestyle medicine. And later on, the opportunity opened up, and I went ahead and, and took a medical school. I also uh, had been involved with the Black Hills uh, Center in Hermosa, South Dakota, with uh, Pastor Louis Torres and uh, Dick Nunes, and also with Dr. Sang Lee in Hawaii, uh, ministering to uh, Japanese and uh, um, Korean uh, patients. And also, I spent many years in Norway at the European Bible School and Fredheim Health Center. In fact, by the time I got back to the States, uh, I was actually starting to give lectures in Norwegian there. And we have been doing a lot of research. Usually every year we submit a paper to the topmost gastro congress in the world called the DDW. I'm not going to talk about these studies, but I just want to mention them briefly. Uh, basically, we're finding out that uh, one of the best medications for uh, gastroenterology procedures, colonoscopies, and, and so forth, is the propofol, and um, we have published quite a bit of, on that. And um, one of the papers that we presented at the Nutrition Congress uh, from Loma Linda, the International Congress on Vegetarian Nutrition, we were uh, showing how people that follow a full plant-based diet they have a quick result in their lipids, cholesterol, triglycerides. Within a matter of days, uh, these markers go down significantly in the people that participate on this. And one of our uh, most important papers that uh, we have been uh, published lately is this one. This one you can actually access on your computer, on your cell phone, if you Google two words. When we uh, submitted for publication this paper, we actually paid $3,000 to make it an open article so anybody could access this article. Just Google two words. Google the word Netly, N-E-D-L-E-Y, and Google the word hypothesis. Uh, those first hits that you're going to see in your browser are the full paper, fully access accessible to anybody that wants to do so. And in that paper, we are exposing our main hypothesis. I'll come back to this paper in a minute. Another uh, paper that we presented, 
This one, we were uh, sharing the results of this study at the International Congress for Diabetes in Washington, D.C. Because we are able to gather a lot of data from our depression program, of course, uh, the patient agrees to be study and, and, and so forth, and we're also very grateful with Andrews uh, University to help us with the IRV. Um, because we have all that data, we're able to do some very interesting correlations. In this study, we were sharing how when somebody has diabetes, if your diabetes is not well under control, that can have a very negative impact on your mental health. And the program is a medical program, our 10-day program. So the patient not only gets better with their mental health, but also their diabetes improves. In many instances, we're able to decrease medication or uh, help the patient uh, get off all their, their, their meds. And we were correlating what happens with the diet that the patient has had before coming to the program. And this is what we found out. People that have diabetes and have an animal-based diet, we can actually predict that their control of diabetes is not going to be the best one. So for diabetes, the best thing you can do is a full plant vegetarian diet. And you can see here, this is using uh, Beck's depression inventory, a standardized test to measure mental health. In this graphic, you can see that even those patients that have diabetes, and in some instances that were not very well under control, when they do the lifestyle changes at the 10-day depression program, their mental health improves dramatically. And we are talking about in 10 days. This is a change that happens. Also, this paper that we presented uh, last year in Miami, Florida, at the World's Addiction Congress. In this one, we were sharing what happens with benzodiazepine usage. If you're not in the medical world, uh, benzodiazepines are medications that are very much used today to treat things like uh, sleep and, most importantly, anxiety, the famous uh, Xanax uh, that, that, that many people use. And what happened with these medications is that they actually work like magic. You have somebody severely anxious, you give them a prescription for arprazolam, lorazepam, and the anxiety goes away. But you leave that person addicted to that medication. See, that's the problem with these medications. So recently, the CDC, uh, if you go to their website, started sharing how this is actually becoming a health crisis around the world because of so many people that are becoming addicted to this type of medications. So right now, there is a lot of interest and research on how are we going to help these people that have these addictions to benzodiazepines. And in this study that uh, it, it was published in the American Journal of Addictions, you can uh, uh, find that on, online, we were showing how people that use these medications on a regular basis, when they come to the eight-week depression program, which in parentheses is an educational program, this is not a medical program. Some of you are going to have the privilege of learning how to do this uh, this afternoon. We'll have it available in, in Spanish and English, that, that workshop. And we were sharing how these people that are using these this benzodiazepines, we dedicate a whole uh, uh, program educating people so they can understand why these type of medications are not the best for their mind because they end up affecting their frontal lobe. And as the person becomes aware of this, now they want to decrease that medication. We encourage people to go back to their primary health provider because it's not uh, as easy as just stopping these medications. There's a certain protocol you're supposed to, to follow. 
And you can see that their usage decreases dramatically when they participate on that eight-week depression program. Now, the interesting thing is that this program is not a benzodiazepine recovering program. Yet, this is a very nice side effect of the people that come to participate on this program. Uh, Medscape, which is a, a publication for scientists and, and physicians, wrote a very nice article about the results of this particular study. You can go ahead and, and access that online also. And not only that, the competition of Medscape, it's called MedPage. And they had also written a very nice article about it, but because Medscape published first, uh, they decided not to go ahead and, 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 and put it in their page. Then this study, very, very important study. This one was presented uh, last year in Washington, D.C. at the Gastroenterology Congress. In this study, we were sharing how the patients that come to our 10-day program and that have hepatitis C, okay, hepatitis C by itself can trigger a depression. And this is the issue. See, nowadays, for hepatitis C, there are a lot of possible therapies that somebody with hepatitis C can go through. But if you have hepatitis C, and you have depression at the same time, some of these therapies cannot be used on you. Do you see the issue? So we were sharing in this study that the 10-day program, no, excuse me, the eight-week program on the people that have this hepatitis C, 97% of them improve their depression. So this is really good news. That means that those patients with hepatitis C that before couldn't go and take certain of those therapies, now that window is open for them to treat their hepatitis C and improve. Uh, the treatment of hepatitis C has improved quite a bit, and now even some patients that have Hepatitis C are able to remove completely the virus from their system. So we were very pleased. It was very well accepted. And this paper was published in the top journal for gastroenterology, the journal called Journal Gastroenterology. Also, uh, a few weeks ago, we were in Southern California uh, at the Addiction Congress in Huntington um, Beach. And in this study, we were sharing our algorithm. What do we do to decrease the benzodiazepines in our 10-day program? How are we able to decrease those benzodiazepines that are hard to remove in just a matter of 10 days? And let me share with you also something about this 10-day program. In that 10-day residential program, the cases that we see are not easy. Those patients that were not being able to treat by somebody else, they try this therapy after therapy after therapy, they're not getting better, they're just bouncing from one provider to the other one. Very difficult cases are the ones that come to the 10-day depression program. And many of them have this addiction to benzodiazepines. And we know that it is a vicious cycle. They're using the benzodiazepines that is affecting their frontal lobe. That doesn't help their depression, but they need to improve their depression, yet they're addicted to this medication, so it's a vicious cycle that we have to break. So we are in contact with the patients before the 10-day program, giving them some indications on how to prepare themselves for this 10-day program. And once they come to the 10-day program, we're able to do some substitutions with their medication. And we are able to decrease dramatically in many instances. They're able to 
finally get free from those uh, benzodiazepines. In some instances, by the end of the program, they're about to finish, and we give them a roadmap, a plan that they need to follow the next few weeks to completely get rid of those benzodiazepines. This uh, paper is going to be coming up in the American Journal on Addictions. There's also another study. I don't have the poster because when we submitted this uh, poster, it was not ready, but now it's, it's ready. I'm just going to uh, uh, share with you this briefly. It was presented in Perth, Australia on alcohol usage. And we were uh, measuring how much alcohol uh, the person is using during our eight-week program. And we found out that 50% of the people that participate in our um, eight-week depression recovery program are able to become alcohol-free, you know, which is very nice. You know, alcohol uh, has been uh, a subject of, of studies, and in fact, if you follow closely the scientific literature and the current guidelines, England finally came with a powerful study sharing how that guideline of encouraging wine usage is not a good one. Okay, if you can find that uh, online if, if you search for it. Another important paper that we presented, this one was presented at the Sports Medicine Congress in uh, Barcelona, Spain. And because this was the Sports Congress, this uh, Congress took place at the stadium of the Barcelona, the famous Barça, the, the, the soccer team. And you could see that this was a very important Congress. The top physicians for most of the sports uh, uh, places were there, from the Mad Real Madrid and Bayern Munich and, 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 and so forth. And in this paper, we were sharing how exercise is such an important thing for mental health. See, we can actually predict how severe you are by your exercise pattern. Those participants that came to our eight-week community-based uh, depression program and didn't have a regular exercise program this type of participants had very high levels of depression and anxiety. Yet, those same participants that had severe depression, as they start incorporating the different elements of the program, and as they start incorporating a regular exercise program, they can be among the ones that do the best in the program. That is why it's such an important thing for yourself to start with an exercise program. What kind of conviction are you going to tell the person, do exercise, if you yourself don't do exercise? So this morning, if you were uh, wake up early enough, you would have seen me run there on the <laughs> nice uh, streets here of Orlando, Florida. And... This uh, particular paper is going to be coming up uh, soon in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So uh, uh, keep looking in that journal. In, in, a, in a few months, it's going to come out. And something important also, we're talking about uh, that type of exercise that make you deep breathe. You know, what is called aerobic exercise. That is the most beneficial type of exercise. And it's, this is not the exercise of, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go around the block and that's it. No, this, this is not the type of exercise that is going to help you. You need some nice, intense exercise, 45 minutes, one hour of exercise to get the most out of the benefit of the exercise. So um, if you're interested, look for that uh, paper to read the, the details. Another study that uh, actually just a, a few months ago, uh, I presented uh, a few blocks from here at the, at the Hilton was the Congress on this one. This was actually an addiction, uh, 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 excuse me, a pharmacological uh, study. And why we were able to get in that Congress is because they also deal with environmental toxins. 
And in this study, we were sharing the importance of activated charcoal. Have you heard about that, activated charcoal? <laughs> activated charcoal as an excellent therapy for spider bites. Okay? The improvement is quite dramatically. And the focus on this one was specifically on a very dangerous spider called the brown recluse spider. See, the brown recluse spider, in certain people, when they get bitten by this spider, it can create a necrosis. The, the tissue dies. Okay? So with the activated charcoal, the person is able to recover quite fast. It's going to be coming up in a, uh, one of the top pharmacological journals, Drug Metabolism Reviews. Another paper we also presented in that, uh, in that uh, particular study, in that particular congress, was one that shared how people that eat fish, fish is directly related to negative effects on your mental health. You know, contrary to what other people publish, our data, this, there's no manipulation of the data, show that people, in, the more fish you eat, the worse your mental health is going to be. And also it's going to be coming up in this uh, pharma journal. And this one, this was fantastic. Dr. Netley mentioned briefly this, but I'm, let me go a little bit with more detail about it. This is the, the paper that we published sharing how emotional intelligence is negatively affected by those people having sexual relationships outside of marriage. And this was uh, shared during the, the, the top uh, sexual congress in the world uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago. And we ran the numbers on emotional intelligence, and we also ran them in depression. Uh, the, the, the depression extremely clear on those people having this type of, of behavior. And it was very interesting. See, I was watching the people before me. They like it so much, they invite me to present from the front these this papers. And I noticed that the master of ceremony had to beg people to ask questions for the other papers that were before this. When I presented this one, those microphones loaded with people. <laughs> and you know, basically, they wanted to justify immorality. They started questioning me that if I had manipulated the data to make it look this way, I told them, no, you know, this is what our data show. You know, this is our great raw data after we run some um, statistical models. Also, another person asked me, why, how come if the person agrees to commit uh, um, adultery, does this have a negative effect also? Well, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. Another one uh, saying, what about those countries in which this type of behavior is more accepted? Would that have a negative effect? It doesn't matter, you know. This is what the raw data shows. And a third study that we presented in that Congress was this one very, very interesting. Those people that have addictive behaviors, alcohol, benzodiazepine, cigarette smoking, illegal drugs, and, and so forth, when you check their past history, many of them have a history of sexual abuse. And see, they are doing this to try to anesthetize themselves. And this tells us that we as health professionals, if you want to help somebody with addictions, make sure you check that part of the history and bring healing to that part if you want to help them overcome that addiction, which is secondary to that behavior. Very fascinating. These uh, papers are going to be coming up in the Journal of Sexual Medicine uh, in the near future. And our flag paper, most important paper, uh, the, the, the one about the hits, our hypothesis is that there are 10 hits for you to develop a depression. In other words, you need to have four or more of these active. At the same time, then depression develops. You can read the paper and the details online. Again, you just Google Netly Hypothesis and you can access that paper. And um, 
I wanted to share with you briefly uh, some of the results uh, with detail that, that we have uh, with our community-based program. As you can, if you can see, three quarters of the participants are females. And this is something that you see. I have 20 years of working in lifestyle centers, and you see this pattern all the time. I believe it's the pride of the male, you know? Not, not until their arm is falling down, that's when they go and see the doctor. While, while females tend to seek the help a little bit earlier. Uh, this program is being run all over the place, uh, including uh, Australia and, uh, and, and New Zealand, uh, parts of Africa, Europe, uh, South America, North America. And you can see that when the person comes, uh, usually has a moderate type of, of depression. And this is the change, that the, the epidemiological picture as they come. Some of them have severe, some of them don't have depression, and so forth. And you can see here that um, a lot of them are able to move all the way to non-depression by the end of the program. And those that have anxiety, the same situation, the, uh, more than three-quarters of them are able to decrease dramatically their anxiety to a level that is non-anxiety. And the most common hits, this is in our uh, uh, residential program, are going to be the circardium and the lifestyle. When they come to the eight-week program, the most common hits is also the lifestyle, but also the frontal lobe and the circadian are going to be involved there. And this is the improvement that is going to happen after those uh, eight weeks. As you can see, things like addictions. Are you aware that our program is even more effective than the Stop Smoking program from the American Lung Association? Even though we're not a stop smoking program, as the person becomes aware of the negative effects of the cigarette, is able to make those dramatic changes. If you can see, one of the hits that improved the most is that nutrition factor. So it's an excellent tool to aid in your communities, in your churches, on improving their mental health. And you can see this number that is fantastic. 85% of them improve by 50% or more their depression. And here you can see how those patients that had the severe depression, 95% of them improve. Now, we have also studied why that 5% didn't improve that much. And this is what we found out. Those are the disobedient participants. If we're telling them, do exercise, and they don't do exercise, change your diet, they don't want to change the diet, change the way you think, they don't want to do this, how can they improve? So the disobedient patient, as you can see, uh, that 5% is not going to, imp going to improve. Don't get discouraged. Uh, keep going and, 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 and motivate them to make those changes. And you can see from that severe depression, they are able to move some of them all the way down to the non-depression, which is fantastic. This is something that you can learn how to do. So we're going to, um, I just want to share with you one last one, and this is the one for anxiety. As you can see, you can have people with severe anxiety, and 93% are going to do that improvement and some of them are going to go, 24% of them are going to go from severe anxiety all the way to non-anxiety. And the different changes. And again, there's going to be a little percentage there, about 5% that are the disobedient one. No, those are not going to improve as much. Um, two last papers I wanted to share with you. One is that, that we're going to be presenting in the Netherlands showing how stroke participants also improve their depression. A stroke by itself can trigger a depression. We're going to be sharing that in a few weeks. And also, uh, two more papers that we're going to be presenting in Boston at the beginning of February for a, a, a top neurology meeting in which we're showing, number one, how participants that have anxiety tend to, to benefit from the usage of lavender oil. Okay? 
as effective as, uh, as benzodiazepines without the negative effects uh, of them. That's going to be coming up on, on that one. And the, the second paper that we're going to be presenting in that meeting in, in, in Boston, um, Massachusetts, it's going to be uh, dealing with lead and depression. How people that have uh, lead uh, access, uh, sometimes the pipes in your house may have lead uh, or, uh, or, or working in certain factories in which they're using lead that can have a negative effect on the mental health. So beware, beware of that. We're going to have a chance to, to do some questions. If you have one of those little cards, you're able to write down those cards, and we'll have a little panel where we will answer those questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in contact.